Okay, good evening, everyone. Uh, it looks like we have everyone here, and I believe we have Councilmember Riddle online, do we, Matt? Yep, yep we do, great. Uh, welcome everybody to the, um, what's the date today? The 20th, uh, Monday, October 24th, uh, Committee of the Whole meeting, and um, I'd like to call this meeting to order. And tonight we only have one item on our agenda, and that is continuing discussion of the proposed 2023-2024 biennial budget, deliberations and recommendations. Um, and as I indicated in, in my email to you folks on Friday, setting the stage for this evening, we're gonna start out with, <clears throat> with uh, uh, our staff, uh, Director Vaughn particularly, answering some questions that uh, were asked uh, in our previous meeting on Thursday, I guess it was. And then we're gonna move on to specific uh, comments from each of us regarding um, changes we'd like to see or not to the, to the proposed budget. And then finally ending up with any provisos. Uh, again, I don't think there's a whole long list here as I understand it, but um, this is the time for us to actually get down to this. Um, and just to let you know, we have a meeting on <clears throat> November 3rd, which I believe is next Thursday. And uh, that is a, I believe that's a special meeting, if I'm not mistaken, Matt, as well. And I will send out an email regarding um, topically what, what's going to be happening at that time. The other thing, too, is we have some optional meetings, and we haven't determined whether or not we'll need those as of yet. Tonight, we'll kind of uh, inform that discussion about whether we'll be canceling the optional meetings. I suspect we will need them, but maybe we won't need to need uh, need to have uh, both of the optional meetings. So with that, uh, Director Vaughn, welcome. Thank you. Um, Matt's going to pull up. A... It's just fun. Um, if Matt could pull up the presentation and we will briefly go over some of the outstanding questions and information that we did not have available at the last meeting, which was just last Thursday. I was trying to buy myself some time, <laughs> still buying time. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, okay, so continued budget discussions. And we're just going to walk down to a brief overview um, what we're gonna, going to cover in this presentation, this brief presentation, which is the property tax levy, the, the sewer rate increases being the King County's portion and the city's portion, the surface water rate increase, the household examples, and then the optional additional, additional excuse me, new revenue. And then we tried to, do the best we could with putting that into um, an additional household example to the best of our ability. So walking in, this slide should be look extremely familiar because it's exactly what was presented on Thursday. So I just wanna say that this is kind of the outline we walked through, we're going to walk through on the next slide, the property tax, and then it's just gonna go down, sewer and then surface water. So going down to the revenue increases on property tax, the proposed 2023 property tax levy that I mentioned, this portion would be coming out in the council packet. So I wanna stay focused on just the, um, the property tax levy is what we define as the 1% being the 33,826 and stay focused on that. And that the current levy rate for 2022 um, you'll see that 2023's is actually going down. So uh, again, always try to provide the calculations. So, cause I know that you're gonna want to figure it out for your own home and your own situation. Um, and then walking over to the median property value, which you can find on the mayor's proposed budget on page 16 um, is 676,400. And then we use that calculation with the current levy for 2022 and to compare against the new levy, proposed levy for 2023. And I do um, 
want to take a minute here to say that the proposed levy rate for 2023, this is preliminary information. So it's based off of every single week we receive a revised update from King County from the assessor's office. And so this is preliminary information. It, it is subject to change. I'm just going to say that all publicly right now. So in case we have different information prior to this Thursday, um, we will make sure that you get an updated copy of that if something does change. So then walking back over to the example of the levy rate, uh, the median value of a home in the Lake Forest Park was 617,000 in 2022. And this is where the very complex concept of when the assessed values go up, the levy rate will go down because the city can only receive this basically the same portion or the same slice of the pie um, plus the 1% or the additional $33,826 and that's distributed over every single parcel and property owner within the city limits. And I'm going to continue going unless we want to pause and ask questions. I'm just. Colleagues, any questions about the question of the levy, setting the levy back. rate? <clears throat> Councilmember Goldman. Oh. Yes, thanks. Uh, could you go to the previous? Yeah, that slide. Um, so I'm going to break the rule and try to do math on TV here. Um, <laughs> if I use the median house, uh, the 2022 median house of 617 and the 2022 levy rate of 838, I get $517. Yes. Mm -hmm. If I use the 2023 numbers, it's 566. And that seems like a 10% increase. So how does that jive with the 1% increase? So this is where it, it, that's the that's the three million dollar question. That's where there's a lot of confusion, actually. Please direct. Your math is absolutely correct because we had this conversation earlier today on the best way to because it's a very complex um, topic to discuss. And you're right, you could take the 617 and you could use that rate and you could times it, but we're trying to keep uh, um, apples to apples, I guess you would say, but you're, it's not wrong per se to take the 2022, that median value and times it by 2022's levy rate. Um, this is where the assessed value will change, but the dollar amount that the entity can receive doesn't change. So when the assessed values, whether they expand, when they expand, the amount, the total collected doesn't necessarily change to the entity being the city's portion. Do you want to, I'm going to pass this over. Since we were the ones having this discussion earlier, <laughs> what we're trying to show on this slide, and this went through several iterations, because I did the same math that Council Member Goldman did, and I'm like, why are we showing it this way? But what this really drives home is if the rate stayed the same, you would collect more. You would go from that 517 last year to the 566, but because the law is, states that you can collect no more than you did before because that value increased, that's what it drives you down to the 476. So that we could have presented all three numbers and maybe that would help clarify it. But yeah, you're right. 517 was what you paid last year. 566 would be what you paid this year if it weren't for the law that drives it down so that the city collects no more than we did last year plus the 1%. So, so can I ask, are you saying then that in terms of the levy rate? Phil, are you saying in terms of the dollar value for the median property value, uh, it will actually Go, the dollar amount will actually go down from 517 to 476. Making sure we have bandwidth for me to have a microphone too. So what I'm saying is, so the, the value, the median value of the home last year across the city was 617 and it jumped to 676, 400. Our rate last year based off of the median value of 617 was 0.83814, which gave us the same amount as we had the year before. But because the values went up, we now have to drop it down to the preliminary number today of 0.70430. 
which then would get to 476. Now, I, I know the question is going to come up. So since I read this earlier um, and trying to wrap our heads around it, and I think there's a magic black box at the King County Assessor's Office that they use. But even if the value, the value of your home could potentially come down, but if the value of somebody else's homes or group of homes come down even further, you could still see a pr price increase or a cost increase to the taxes you pay. I wish I could explain to you what happens in that magic black box that they have. I don't have a clue. Um, that's beyond this. But at the end of the day, and, and I think that's where some of the frustration comes from some homeowners as they look at it and go, my values went down, but my property tax went up $15. Why is that? And that that's a nuance that I think we would have to ask the county to come in and really explain it. There's a video they have I would like to watch and see if that helps further explain it. Um, Councilmember Fertani. Yes, thank you. And I appreciate everybody's explanation so far. I think what it comes down to is we probably shouldn't be using the median value number at all then, because, you know, my expectation was the two red arrows there, right? One's going up, one's going down. It should have worked out to be the same, right? So the amount that we collected per house last year should be the same as what we collected uh, this year, plus 1%, maybe, whatever. But my point is that um, maybe the number to look at is what the city receives from the county itself, right? And show that that is essentially flat. It's an interesting thought. Councilman Riddle, you've been patient. Thank you. Um, I mean, to me, I the way I think about it is it's, it's a property tax revenue lid. That's why we have a levy lid lift. Um, and I know it was explained to me in prior years that because we have commercial properties, that kind of throws that balance of what a residential property versus a commercial property carries. And I think typically commercial properties carry a slightly higher percentage burden of the, the taxes than the residential. So they won't see a full 1% sometimes. It, again, magic black box has been spoken of before. Um, but I think the thing to remember is that it's a it's a lid on the amount of revenue we can collect regardless of what actually happens in the real market uh, and that that disconnect is what causes us the issues that we're seeing thank you councilman uh, councilman Bodie. i don't want to lose this though because to me it says the median assessed value home in lake forest park pays in the ballpark of only 500 dollars a year to the city so i want to keep that math because that was what was lost in the whole prop one discussion um you know people because you know if you have like 50 dollars that's a 10 percent increase but it's only 50 dollars right so i think we were talking about a 35 dollar increase in prop one for the for the medium priced house and yet that was something that you know we had trouble communicating because it is so complicated so i i don't want to lose i i don't disagree with you council member foratani but i don't want to lose some version of this that we are most comfortable with when we when we go to the public hearing, because that's a measly amount of money compared to what's going to other sectors um, reflected in our property tax that go up on a regular basis and don't have the 1% cap. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Deputy Mayor. Um, and thank you for the, to the staff and uh, for doing this work for us. Um, I do remember from past years that this is always the most complicated thing. And I have to say that I think I was the one who raised the issue of, you know, having some examples, but actually it wasn't about the property tax. It was about the sewer and the surface water tax. So, which I think is going to be a little easier. Um, but I, I will just say that every year when the assessor sends out those little postcards, you know, there always is a bit of a shock because the assessed value changes a lot. Um, ours went up considerably, but I expect it to come down again next year, actually, because the markets, you know, changed again. Um, and it's really hard for people not to imagine that that is going to increase their property tax. Really, really difficult. And so um, thank you for even attempting to explain this because, 
even those of us who sit through these meetings and um, try to wrap our heads around it, you know, on an annual or biannual, biannual basis, still, you know, don't quite get there. But for the general public, this is really, really hard. And um, I just want to say again that I appreciate the work that you've done here, but we all must keep in mind that um, Councilman Riddle is absolutely correct, that lid is on the total amount we collect and what each household contributes to that total varies on an annual basis according to several factors, not just the market, but also new properties that are built, changes in um, our commercial property uh, landscape, you know, what's out there and how they're doing, as well as the variation in some houses that have been added onto, other houses that are, you know, not in such good shape anymore. I mean, so many factors go into this that it's extremely difficult to come up with a real life example. So for those of you, the few people in the general public who may be listening, <laughs> um, you know, please uh, just relax and understand that things are not going to be terrible. It's just that it's very hard to explain. Council will refer Tony. Thank you. Um, and I appreciate the uh, uh, grace that uh, Council Member Bodie's extended me. You're absolutely right. For 500 bucks a year, 40 bucks a month, we're basically getting police, we're getting, you know, we're getting the streets paved, that kind of stuff. And that's not a uh, not bad thing to not lose sight of. I think I meant to say it that way. Yes. Um, also, I realized that in uh, Director Vaughn's uh, presentation, my numbers are actually up there. They're just really small. In the upper left corner of the slide is literally the $3 million or so that we do get from the state and uh, or from the uh, county. And the point is that basically, yeah, there is that 1% increase right there, the 33,000 that was referred to in the mayor's budget. So thanks. Uh, all excellent comments, everybody. And, and Councilmember Goldman, my, my comment about saying this, that's sort of the, the, the $3 billion question or whatever else, it's just in reference to variety of new things. This has been the perennial challenge, not only for us, if you, you know, um, I believe Councilor Bodhi on the Sound Cities Association, they've all previously expressed the same kind of confusion. I think it was about this time last year that, and it is the cities all are terribly frustrated about how to explain to their, their residents, the reality is exactly what, what we've been saying. And that is, it is, it is, there's a cap on the amount of revenue that we're allowed to take in. It doesn't matter what your value is. I mean, it does, but it doesn't, uh, the final valuation. Um, and I'll give you an interesting thing. When the, the assessor's cards came out, um, just, I, it was just not a few weeks ago, uh, I, my phone blew up from a neighbor and he said, my, my assessed value went up 37%. I'm gonna be priced out of my home based on the property taxes. And I said, John, take a deep breath. That is not what is going to happen to your property taxes. Remember the Iman, unfortunately, the 1% cap on, uh, on property tax uh, receipts. And, and he calmed down and I said, I would invite you to look at the assessor's website. They are doing a good job of getting additional tools up. They have them up again for this year. I wish we could have them up perennially for just have them up all the time um, for each of the jurisdictions so people could, could look at the numbers. But this is a difficult message and um, the administration has done a very good job of showing the pie about the percentage that we, that we receive here. And it is really an important message as Councilmember Bodhi said, that we keep this number about the end and, and you reiterated Councilmember Furtani, this, this small amount of money that people are paying to get all these services and yet, we still need to figure out ways to make things work. Yes, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor. That made me think when I talk to most people, they think that they are paying the current levy rate on their new assessed value. Plus we have the ability to get an additional 1% um, every year. And so that is, that is your neighbor's perception is, is the common perception among smart people. I don't think this 1% cap is understood or what the change in the assessed value means with the 1% cap. But when, when I talk to people who have been involved even in city 
you know, decision making or paid attention to financial things. They think that the current levy rate for 2022 is going to be applied to their new assessed value. And then there's an extra add on that the city does every year. So I'll just say that that is the common perception your neighbors. Indeed. And, and it comp it's complicated further by misconceptions about being able to compare jurisdictions and levy rates too, because some jurisdictions have different things broken out. For example, we have fire and EMS that's broken out separately from our, uh, uh, from our city levy rates. That was done a number of years ago. There's a variety, and it was actually referenced by, by uh, a member of the public in, a, in public comment a number of weeks ago. And so that's very confusing. I keep going back to um, the, uh, uh, Schoolhouse Rock. I wish there was a Schoolhouse Rock version of an explanation <laughs> for this, you know, um, so people and, and myself could explain it better. Director Vaughn, thank you. Are there any other yes. thoughts before we move on? Because this is a very important topic and it's going to come up a lot. Thank you all, please. I appreciate hearing all of the conversation because then it helps me come up with a more holistic way to explain this in the future. Um, so thank you for the conversation in, in addition, because it is a very complex subject. So moving on to uh, the sewer rate increases. Um, in For 2022, uh, we mentioned breaking out the, here we just call it the county, but it's King County's portion, and which is the significant portion of the sewer rate. And what that does is we are paying King County for all of the treatment services, which is the bulk of the rate that is um, passed through to them. Um, and then there's the city portion of the sewer rate. And here we, we listed out 2022, 2023, and 2024 to show the dollar changes of the monthly increases and the um, the percentage as a total. So before we've continued to talk about the city's portion increasing by 3% and the county's portion increasing by 5.75, but total together, it's a 5% increase. And then walking over to the commercial um, side, this is done a little bit differently and um, that rate is increasing at the, the same amount. Um, the same percentage, I should say, not the same dollar amount, the same percentage. And then walking down the residential because the city is does bill on a bi-monthly um, cycle. So the rate that or your typical bi-monthly um, sewer bill that you would be receiving would be at the 145.76. And then the annual amount that a customer would be receiving, a residential customer in Lake Forest Park would be receiving is the 874.56. Are there any questions? Yep. Councilmember Bush. Yep. Um, just thank you very much. This is very helpful and really clear to me, at least. Um, I, my only suggestion going forward is that instead of the bi-monthly billing amount, we just show it even though we don't bill it that way as a monthly amount. Um, and because I think that um, the bi-monthly gets lost in the translation a little bit. So, uh, and people don't do the, the mental math to kind of figure it out. So I'm just, I'm just thinking about, you know, when we have our public hearing, I think it would be better to show it as a monthly amount. And if you wanted to drop a footnote saying residents are built bi-monthly or something like that, that's fine. Uh, I just think monthly is, uh, monthly is the way I tend to think about it. Thank you, Laurie. Colleagues, other thoughts? Mr. Goldman. Yep. Um, yeah, thanks for this. I'm just curious if you know the historical background and why the sewer rates are flat as opposed to either being billed on consumption or based on the property value. So, so can you can you repeat? So it looks like, like every parcel in the city pays the exact same, or is this a rate based on the dollar value of the house or is it a, like everyone pays $49. Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay. Th thank you. No, thank you for clarifying the question. So you are correct. 
um, the residential is a single family home. So the residential um, is a single family home and that rate is paid at the 7288. Um, if it's commercial or multifamily, it's consumption based and that is dependent on um, the water consumption. And so that's how it's calculated. So I suppose my question is, is that a city decision or is it a state rule that says that for single family, every parcel pays the exact same amount regardless of usage or value? I believe it was, I, I, I may have to check on this, but I believe that that's how it's stated in our code. So I will have to double check on that though. I'm just wondering if it might be more equitable to think about switching to a system that is based on either of those as opposed to everyone pays the exact same amount. So the challenge, and I will just state this, the challenge, um, the challenge with charging a variable rate is that the city does not hold its own water. We cannot, uh, the consumption based approach is very challenging for this entity because we, we do not hold that information readily available. Other entities that I have worked for and is a common practice is based on consumption, water consumption for sewer, which can be a good and a bad thing. I'm just gonna say, because sometimes when you have a leak, um, it's based on water consumption. So there are some challenges on both sides. Um, being a flat rate like this, you can very easily, like when we sell homes and we discuss um, escrows with, with new customers coming in, we can very distinctly tell them that annually they will be receiving, their annual sewer amount is going to be eight seventy four fifty six dollars if they are a single family home. If they're on the commercial side, uh, we can give them a range of the history um, and it's it's based on uh, um, I believe it's a five year it's a calculated consumption so it rounds um, so there are there are benefits and challenges to both I think that it would be and I guess this is just from a finance director's point of view and I will double check on historically why the sewer rate has been established this way and get you a solid answer. But um, I do believe that it is because we, d we don't hold the rights or to the water, which is how it would be based in other entities as that charge. Okay, thank you. That's an excellent question, Mr. Goldman. I mean, we have, we're, yes. Oh, thank you. Um, just on point, we, we're served by four water districts. So it's, it's a little bit challenging. There was uh, back almost 30 years ago, a move to consider having sewer rates from the county be based on water consumption. And at that time, uh, what they said is if you're doing irrigation, you can install a separate meter for irrigation so you won't be charged on the consumption based on that. So there are a lot of households in Lake Forest Park that have two meters because of the, that have never been turned on because of the concern about the consumption charge for the sewer uh, rates. Councilmember Riddle. Thank you. Uh, are there any jurisdictions that use like number of restrooms or number of plumbing fixtures as a sort of a way to address consumption without a direct calculation? Or is that something that you're not familiar with at this time? I think my best answer to that is it's based on per cubic foot not necessarily, uh, it's, it's the consumption of water to translate to sewer. Um, so I know for like, obviously we're talking about sewer here, but if we were talking about like a septic system, those are designed by bathroom to, you know, to, to accommodate the, the, the flow and the, the capacity. So um, I know that there's, there's some calculation out there that's related to that system, which obviously we, we are looking at sewer, which is a little different, but I was curious if other jurisdictions use something more akin to number of bathrooms or number of plumbing I, fixtures. I, I would suggest, I, Councilman Riddle, we're getting a little far afield here um, well, because this is getting into out of rate setting. I, I'm gonna have to lean on some other don't need directors. an answer right now either. I'm just more of a curious question to kind of maybe address later. Thank you. 
Dr. Vaughn, please. Okay, so moving on to the surface water rates. Um, so to simplify this, this is probably a little bit more of a simplified version is the it's class class description and then it's showing the 10 percent um which i just realized here is not stated but it's the 10 percent um is the in proposed increase and going from 2022 um is the current rate to uh the 2023 rate and the difference and that amount shown within the difference is the annual amount and then I'm going to pause here for questions. <laughs> Colleagues, questions. This this question was brought, or this uh, discussion about commercial and surface water rates was brought up at our previous meeting. Anybody have a follow up question, or is this this is very helpful? Vice Chair Castover. Thank you. Um, so the the class two through two through seven are those those apply to commercial properties. That is my and understanding but i'm gonna to have to lean on director perigo on okay so he believes that's a fair statement so okay. i just realized <laughs> just for the record all right thank you so so every single family residence in the city pays the the class one rate and then multifamily or commercial are are given a class according to their a level of impervious area and that is how they're assessed is that correct all right thank you phil did you have a, a thought no i was just going to say since director perigo doesn't have a microphone that is correct <laughs> <laughs> thank you for that any yes please Catherine. so how did you go about um estimating or calculating that 10 percent was the right amount so the city is well aware that um from our previous discussion on thursday that through operations the operational costs are increasing at a significant rate with all of the NPDES, which is the <laughs> Clean Water Act. See, it, I am teachable. <laughs> um, the Clean Water Act, uh, all of those requirements that are being um, federally mandated, that is having a significant cost on the operating fund. And then in addition, the city has been a leader in create or not creating, <laughs> constructing and redoing all of the culverts. And so we've just finished the L60 culvert, um, which again has is actually um, a mandate. And we did complete that culvert. We're working on the design of L90. And so we um, landed on that 10% of an increase for over the course of 2023 and 2024 was an amount that, um, it, although a little bit, maybe a little bit high, um, we have to remember that we also didn't raise the rates from during the pandemic. So there were two years there where the city did not increase rates. And if we would have increased those rates, it would have been about the same amount. And that's how we landed on the 10%. Now you're you're proposing that it's 10% each year. That is correct. And um and so yes, we are proposing 10% each year because we need to catch up and make sure that we're covering our cost on the operating side, but in addition that we're supporting the capital side and we're rebuilding. We've we've um we've appropriately used that fund balance for projects 
And so now it's time we're asking to rebuild it and put whatever isn't needed for the operating fund and the appropriate reserves. We're, um, we're asking to put that into the capital side of the surface water for the city moving forward. So it's the surface rate increase does two things. It's doing the operating side, but it's also um, increasing for the capital, which is an ongoing need in this city. So I thought I saw another hand here. Was Councilor Bodie or no one else? Okay. Um, and just on topic again, we've talked about this before. And if Andy were here, he could give us an additional, uh, far more professional insight than I can. But there is current and um, current regulations and things that are coming down the pike as well that are going to be very impactful to um, the cost of running a surface water program. And so this is a very uh, important thing for us to be keeping in mind. Councilor Fertani. And this is a question in general to uh, the, the folks who work in the city. Um, are, are, is there any um, concern that the state might change to a model where there's a tax on impervious surfaces regarding surface water as opposed to the way that this is set up? Or will there be any major changes that you see coming down the line? Because I know California and specifically uh, Los Angeles County just changed it over to an impervious surface percentage model where you um, have to pay a surcharge if you're above 20% impervious surface or something like that. On your property. So I'm wondering if you've heard of anything like that. I would have to defer to Director. I, I have not. Um, I, I, Los Angeles, of course, has very specific challenges relative to impervious surfaces and, and runoff and, and pollution. Um, but what they're talking about is increasing the, uh, the requirements to make sure that things are um, contained and treated you know, uh, catchments, uh, infiltration, really. Uh, that's the best I can offer. Phil, do you have any thoughts or more about that? Good question, thank you. Okay, so walking into the household examples. So the Lake Forest Park, a residential customer, I took the 2022, the, um, the sewer rate and the surface water. And I tried to do it on a monthly basis and it doesn't, it, I did put a little note here in 2022 that it is rounded because the math doesn't perfectly work out. So there's some sense in the background and I just noted it because I know that I have individuals that are going to be calculating the math right now. So there is some variance there. So uh, we've done the monthly, the approach of trying to do the monthly rate um, for 2023 and the, the annual rate to show the difference. And then the increase showing on a monthly basis about $5 and 32 cents. And then on, um, the other hand, the annual amount increasing about 63.79. And probably, um, if this is um, appreciated, maybe we will make sure that this goes into the public hearing too, as an example. Colleagues, questions on this example? I think this should very much so go into the public hearing, but I defer to all of you. Councilor Bodie. I My comment is just in terms of presentation. I think increase monthly about and annually should be like right on top. Uh, so that you don't have to, you know, get through all the numbers to get to it. So it's just a presentation issue. Again, I think we want our most important takeaways to be at the top of the page and in bigger font or something. So uh, I'd leave that to your judgment on what you think is the most important takeaway. But in this one, I think the monthly and annual increase uh, is is the important takeaway. The examples then just serve to illustrate that. Councilmember Riddle is next and then Councilmember Goldman. Thank you. And I believe both the sewer rate and the surface water uh, rate are eligible for the senior and disabled um, citizen discount program or is it just the sewer? 
I know for sure that the sewer is, I would have to double check on the surface water management fees to make sure that they also, um, I'd have to double check on that. And I wouldn't want to misstate that publicly, of course. but I, I think in line with uh, council member Bodhi as a, as a presentation to the community, it would be useful for those that are struggling to make these payments to understand which ones are eligible for that discount and which ones would not be. Thank you, Councilman Riddle. Councilman Goldman. Yeah, thanks. Um, I think yeah, this example really does help clear it up. Um, thinking about presenting it to the public, one of the things that jumps out at me on the previous slide was the number ten percent. That that's you know that huge increase coming, but then because the surface water rate is so much lower than the sewer rate, there are actually sim there are similar absolute dollar increases. And so making it clear to the public that yes, it's a 10% increase, but it's a 10% increase of a relatively small number. So that will help, I think, soften the blow a little. Thank you, Councilmember Cassover. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Councilmember Goldman, because that's exactly why I asked for this. <laughs> um, and I would have to uh, really agree with my colleagues here that that uh, monthly, monthly and annual increase uh, information is the key piece uh, on this page and should be uh, highlighted in some way um, so that members of the public who are um, watching or listening can understand that 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 is the total annual increase to their budget of both considering both of these uh, increases. Any other thoughts <clears throat> on the household example? Mr. Lebo. So if I understand on both of these rates, it's based upon unit, meaning a household. It's not based upon the income or property value of the house. That is correct. And so, so to get to a total impact to the uh, resident uh, or the homeowner, you'd have to include the property tax value, which would be um, kind of apples and oranges because every property pays this increase, but those that have a higher valued house pay more for the 1% increase. You definitely raise a good point. And that's why on the property, the first slide, we always provide the calculation so that everybody can do take their assessed value from the cards that were just sent out a couple of weeks ago um, per uh, Deputy Mayor French's uh, comment that you can take that for your own um, situation at your property and you can calculate to know the exact increase overall that it will have to, to your household. But to the extent, for example, if you are a household that has um, a median price of 676,000, that's you could calculate the total increase, which includes both the sewer and surface plus the property tax increase. But if you have a $1.5 million home, if the current uh, average is $1.4 million for a sale of a new home, that's a different rate, different value, correct? I was just wondering if we should just begin to show those examples where we include all the taxes that are being levied, not just the surface and the property tax or that the homeowner has to actually run the calculations to figure it out. Mr. Cassiter. Yeah, I mean, I, I really, first of all, there's a lot of people that um, don't know what their current assessed value is because the assessor sends these out in groups. Not all the city gets their new assessment at the same time. So some people will have got it several months ago. I just got it two weeks ago or a week ago. Um, so yeah, I think it's, and people also who don't pay a lot of attention to this get very, very confused between assessed value from the assessor's office and the market value of their house that they read on Redfin or some other website. So it's really very difficult to be clear I mean, we really did learn this last year. It's very, very difficult to help people understand the property tax system in the state of Washington. And um, 
You can say many times, look at the assessor's value of your home and people will still look at the market value. It's just really hard. I, I don't know how to, to help you any further with that. How's everybody? I would just encourage us to keep these um, examples separate because uh, the property tax one is so confusing and it does depend on so many factors. It isn't even just your uh, assessed value because of how the formula works and how the annual increases are limited in the increases in your assessed value. So it's just a, a can of worms. But if we wanted to use uh, in, in the property tax example, Another example of a you know eight hundred thousand dollar assessed value home, which is probably a home in the real world worth you know a million dollars, right? Uh, in or the old market anyway. <laughs> um, but if we wanted to add, um, you know, go up to um, eight hundred thousand as an example, uh, and add that example, I think that would be that would be fine and would would help illustrate a little bit of a range. I'm not so worried about going higher than that because higher than that, if your property tax goes up, you know, to 600 or 700 a year, you're probably not going to care that much, right? So I think those those ends of the range, uh, the median and maybe 800,000 would be good to illustrate the point council member Lebo was talking about. Thank you, council member. Uh, council member for Atani. <clears throat> well, thanks. Yeah. Um, so I guess the question I have is, does the county provide a range of what the property tax bill will do in the following year? In other words, for the city, you know, your property tax could drop, say, 3%, and it could go up as much as 14% or something like that. Do they ever give a range of that kind of thing? Not to my knowledge. And um, I would probably refer back to the first slide on this comment by saying that if we didn't increase the the 1% of that additional almost 34,000, that you would just have that starting point that, um, and I'll refer back to that number here really quick, um, that you would have, it's a 3 million, 3 point, basically 3.3. Um, um, so you, that would be your base that you would, you would continue to have. And that's, that would be it. Yeah, the, the reason is, um, going back to my comment about medians, is that the median kind of hides a lot of the variability that could exist in the system. So, you know, if we're trying to convey our concern to um, everyone in the city about, yes, we understand that your assessment has gone up this much, but if we can say, look, the county says that it's only going to change by this to this, which is a much smaller range, then that would go a long ways to allaying a lot of people's fears about being priced out. Uh, thank you, council member. I, I think that in my mind, I look at, as we are considering these kinds of, unfortunately, sometimes necessary increases, I'm thinking about, and this is what you uh, hinted at really, is the most vulnerable people within our community. Uh, previous conversations and, uh, over the years, we've had um, people reach out to us who said, this may not seem like a lot, to you folks, but to us, it's the difference between paying for medication or, or, or something else. And so I know we're all very sensitive to, um, to those considerations and we don't undertake any changes lightly. Any other thoughts on the household example? Uh, I think that the information is really important to get out there. And I, I was reminded too, if you drive down, I'm trying to remember exactly which road it was, but right now, Shoreline has a has a, uh, a their uh, MNO levy uh, renewal on, on the ballot, and there's a big sign. I believe it's on 205th, and it has uh, information on it that is based upon the uh, misunderstanding about how property taxes are levied. And and so I think that really illustrates the challenge that we all have in terms of the communication. So. Um, that we can certainly have an additional conversation about this to make sure that we can help people understand and, and understand where the resources are so they can get the data they need to make decisions. Okay, let's, uh, Director Vaughn. Okay, so walking into the um, final couple slides, um, this slide should look familiar again from Thursday. So it's just um, highlighting again, 
that we're going to try to use a household example on the vehicle license fees and um, sales tax uh, on this one. This one is really quite challenging to come up with a way to show an impact <laughs> to a household. So we kind of left that one alone. And then I do actually have to go back on something I stated previously, where I said the sewer utility tax and the surface water utility tax were not a direct 6%. And really, um, they are a direct 6% increase. And so I do need to, to restate that for the record that I did state that correctly, um, incorrectly on Thursday's meeting. So then with that brief overview, we're going to walk into a household example. And um, so in 2023, with the rate increases, um, we just use that total amount and you could reference it back a couple slides prior. And then with the vehicle licensing fee increase, um, we're just doing, again, we, we have some assumptions here, so we're stating them. So assuming there's two vehicles per household at $10, that would be an additional $20 on the sales tax, kind of what I previously stated, that would completely vary per household. Um, the benefit there is that anybody traveling and spending money within uh, Lake Forest Park also shares that increase. And then um, walking down to the sewer utility tax of 6%, that is based on the 2023 annual sewer rate of the 874.56. And then um, the surface water utility tax is the 1477 is based on the proposed 2023 um, surface water rate increase. So if the city, um, if the council elected to do some of these uh, new revenue options, um, additional optional, um, the increase would be about $87 um, estimated, keeping a couple factors in mind. If the sales tax um, was implemented, it would vary. Um, but this is kind of our, our a, a best um, stab at trying to, to relay um, directly what what a household example of the new revenues, what cost impact they would have to a residential customer. And then I, the one additional piece that was asked on the u, um, utility taxes um, for the, the sewer and the surface water is what are our neighbors doing? And I stated that I could only speak to the previous entity that I worked for and um, I will state that they are still, the city of Duval is still at 10%. The city of Monroe is at 10%. A city of North Bend is at six. Shoreline's at six. Kenmore is at zero. However, they are, they are proposing uh, implementing it in this budget. So um, food for thought on that. City of Snoqualmie is 9%. City of Bothell is 6%. City of Issaquah is 3%. So just to give you a range of um, what other entities are doing um, on some of these utility taxes in addition. I would put some of that information on this slide. I'd pick um, uh, not the 0% because they're proposing to increase that, but the, the 6 to 10% range reflecting that. From, uh, from the range of cities, some of those, you know, and just name the cities. And I will, I will state that the reason why I did some of those cities is I know some are a little bit smaller, but I also know that some of them are just a hair uh, larger. City of Monroe's just a little bit bigger than we are. Shoreline's our neighbor, um, Bothell's our neighbor, um, and S Snoqualmie's about the same size as, I think maybe just a little bit smaller maybe a little bit bigger than we are. I'm not sure on their new population size. I know they've been growing. So, but I tried to create a range within close to our population and our proximity. <laughs> Thank you. Councilmember Goldman. 
Um, yes, thanks for this. Um, thinking about how we reach out to the public, I think a possible point of confusion is the distinction between the sewer utility tax increase and the sewer utility rate increase. Because a lot of people are gonna use the words tax and rate interchangeably, but as a city, we mean those as two different things. That is a good concern. Point. And speaking of clarity too, I would just, my humble suggestion would be in terms of unfocusing your eyes on a slide like this, have the annual increase much higher on the top and put the new revenue someplace down below because people's eyes are gonna go right to that $1,200. Um, and without reading the, the fine print, so to speak, uh, we've been led to here, so we've been following it. Again, my, putting my marketing hat on, how's that example, you know, with a simple suggestion of saying, probably an annual increase of around 87.24 and then define it. Um, that is actually like a lawyer's motto. You, know, you start with your conclusion up front and then you give your explanation and then you repeat your conclusion. <laughs> so you don't have to repeat your conclusion, but starting with your most important takeaway up front is a good thing. Yeah, thank you. This is very helpful. Um, Mr. Lebo. Uh, I appreciate the discussion, but uh, the mayor's budget didn't ask for this these increases. And so I would be hesitant to go into a discussion about increasing these taxes uh, without having an idea of where they're gonna go. I don't think we should just increase taxes because we can. I think we should increase taxes because we have to, not because we can. And so far there hasn't been any discussion about where these revenues would go. Colleagues, thoughts on the topic? <coughs> Councilor Rabodi. I thought we were looking at these because when we look at our, um, our stable revenues and, uh, and, and our projections over time, we need to set the stage and it's better to set the stage uh, and deal with things incrementally than to suddenly end up in a situation where you say, are looking at a 10% utility tax. So I thought it was looking at our, uh, especially in light of our general fund uh, and increases in salaries and salary pressure uh, that for both our existing staff and potential new hires uh, that we were, and, and increases in operating costs too. I'm, it's not just salaries and benefits, though that's a, a big chunk of our budget that we were planning for the future. So I do think that's a really good point, Council Member Lebo, that we probably need to have that rationale presented um, as part of um, anything we want to say in the public hearing. It, but, but that's my understanding. And I think these are fairly modest amounts with that in mind. It's kind of the uh, starting place. So we're not lag, always lagging. Um, and I understand that it, these are, are tough times. And so I also support council member Riddle's idea that where we do have low income provisions um, where people can get community relief, we should highlight those because we're not trying to do this on the backs of people who are um, struggling, but we we do need to make sure that our our community supports just even the base of services we have right now. I'm not I, we're not looking at expanding anything, so that's my my, my vision, uh, John. Councilmember um, Riddle, and then uh, Vice Chair Cassop. Yeah, I think I'm taking this as an educational. This is what we could do. This is what 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 some numbers that have been proposed. What we do with it is, as a council, we decide, do we want to offset one-time revenue to be more stable? Do we want to add services? I know uh, Council Member Bodie was like, that's a little challenging to do in this landscape, but but we do have safety issues. We do have issues retaining and uh, acquiring uh, staff uh, for PD, for public works. So we have some issues that we have to deal with. I don't think I would accept this additional revenue if we didn't in fact have a purpose for it. But it's a wonderful thing for us to understand. What is it that's on the table as a, as a particular number? And then what, what does our community uh, 
typical residential customer, what is their impact? So that's what I'm learning right now. I think what we do with this information is really the next step as I've uh, kind of understood um, vice chair, um, uh, deputy mayor French was, was saying, it's like, let's, thank you. I'll get there, Tom, I'm sorry. <laughs> You're fine. We all have we all have senior moments. So far. <laughs> I'm too young for senior moments, but I appreciate I appreciate the push. Why are we looking at this? For me, offset one-time revenue, so we can use that one-time revenue for one-time costs. And do we need to look at additional service expansion, and what would that look like? That's what I am coming out of this discussion with. Thank you, Councilmember Riddle, and no apology necessary at all, Councilmember uh, or Vice Chair Kessler. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy Mayor. Um, so it's very clear that the rate increases are uh, going directly into those areas that um, we charge the rates for, which are sewer and um, surface water, and that there's work to be done in both of those uh, areas of the city. The tax um, increases which are fairly modest, they are not, uh, it's not gonna bring in you know, enormous amounts of money to the city. They are gonna help deal with the con continuous pressure that we have from inflation and um, from the needs that we are not able to fulfill with the current revenue. And so I don't have a problem with identifying these as reasonable and beneficial sources of revenue to the city that will maintain the level of service that our citizens expect. So I'm perfectly comfortable with um, identifying these and with uh, uh, approving them as good strategy going forward. Thank you, Philippa. Yes, Mr. Hill. Just wanted to, I pulled up my new revenue options slide that we've done previously, uh, just to give you a value idea of what these numbers are about. So the TBD vehicle license fee, $10 increase, that would go into the street fund directly, but that's $109,000 annual value. The, to the vice chair's point, the 6% utility tax generates about $192,000 a year. The sewer utility tax, 78,000. So that's an annual value of 270,000. That can flow directly into the general fund. And so if you remember back to the council retreat, these were presented as options to help you fill that gap of a roughly $600,000 a year of general fund revenues to expenses. So just to put some context and some numbers back in. Thank you, Mr. Hill. That's, that's very helpful. Um, Colleagues, Mr. Fratani, Mr. Goldman, thoughts on um, some of these potential new revenue options? Not to put you on the spot, but please. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I'm not on the spot. Um, in fact, I appreciate Administrator Hill's comment because I, I was trying to find that slide. And of course, it's not in the mayor's budget. But yes, um, that uh, structural deficit that we're having in our general fund really does concern me. And anything we can do to at least slow down the rate at which it's increasing would be a great idea. So I am in general in favor of these increases just so that we can avoid fiscal cliff in a few years. Thank you, Councilmember. Councilmember Goldman. Um, I also, I, I concur with my colleagues. Um, I would like to see us at least put forward an explanation, whether it's we need to put this into making streets safer in the case of the TBD money or explaining out we need to do, you know, like the bronze level. This is what we need to just ba basically maintain our sewer system or we need to do this for the general fund. Um, I'm okay with it. I, I just think we do need to provide an explanation that, I wouldn't be thrilled if it's, oh, it's just going to go into the general fund as general money. I, I'd like there to be a, a more specific, you know, here are some things we might do with it. But in principle, that seems reasonable. Thank you, Council Member. Just a couple of thoughts from my perspective. I think um, Mr. Fratani really said exactly what I've been thinking. I, I think in, in the aggregate, I'm, I, I believe that this, some of these are definitely the right uh, choices to consider, uh, if not all of them potentially subject to sort of descriptors of what 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 
um, generally what they could possibly be working towards. And, and I would say that I have real, I have real concerns uh, uh, with this uh, structural issue that's coming down the pike. The longer we wait to move forward with these things, even if it was some sort of ballot measure or anything else, we're gonna be falling another year or two behind and that line is gonna get closer and closer where it cross, those lines are gonna get closer and closer where they cross. To me, for example, the TBD at $10, it's it, in effect, it's a pay to play. If you're driving on the roads, we have desperate need uh, for safety improvements as well as, as overlay, uh, additional overlays. And um, that one to me almost seems like, uh, um, unfortunately, a given, given the circumstances right now, because we don't have the kind of revenues that some of our neighboring communities have from sales tax or b &O tax, et cetera, as being largely residential community. Um, so that's, those are my thoughts. And I, and I do believe that from the standpoint of the specific uses of these funds, uh, that additional money, going back to Mr. Hill's slide from uh, first introduced, I believe, was at the retreat, that is going to go a long ways towards helping us push that, um, that challenge out. And as a reminder, we talked about this last week, the, uh, a lot of what our budget is, um, the holes are being plugged by one-time uh, revenues right now. We're dipping into some things that we really, I personally am not so happy about doing uh, in case the other shoe drops. So just my two cents worth. Um, other thoughts on revenue increases, and we can certainly talk about this at our meeting next week as well. Councilmember Bodie. <laughs> Um, so I think we're landing on uh, the importance of describing um, three bundles here, uh, and, and maybe there's a fourth, I don't know. One is kind of um, uh, operating and capital expenses associated with the sewer and surface water programs driven by federal, um, state, and county uh, mandates to do more or um, to... Um, expand the scope of what we're doing. And as a small city, we just don't have, we have not really, we have a one, we have a one person program right now, basically, to, to do that, um, uh, you know, uh, in terms of the lead staff person. Um, and this, the second category is transportation. And there, if, if we're comfortable, we had talked uh, as council member Lebo, I think was the one who originally suggested that when we do our street overlay programs, we're also gonna look at walkways. So I'd like to not just talk about street safety there, but also the fact that where we have opportunities to improve walkways as part of that, we're going to use some of these funds to, to do that. If that doesn't mean that suddenly we're going to have a massive sidewalk program throughout the city, but I think there is a, a, a walkway improvement um, aspect to that, that we don't, we don't want to make it just all about you know, sounding like we're paving roads and that's all we're doing, you know? So, so that, was, that was the nuance I was gonna raise. And then I think the, the taxes, the third bundle, the um, sewer and surface water taxes, that is to deal with, as council member Foratani said, the structural deficit that we see that we've been lucky to mask with one-time funding, but we don't have uh, assurances of that. I could see a question coming up on, well, what are you doing with the traffic camera revenues? Because there are some people who focus in on that. So I just flag that as a question that we um, might want to be prepared for. But I just wanted to kind of try to summarize what I thought I was hearing. Thank you, Councilmember Bodie. Councilmember Lieber. I, I, I strongly believe in investing and that we have enough money to do so, that we just don't push off into the future. I think though that um, we, we are not yet in a good position to really demonstrate where we're gonna spend our money. We're talking about in this biennium to have a surface water master plan. We're talking about having a sewer master plan. And I strongly recommend that we have a safety overlay pedestrian mobility plan that Currently, we're, I'm not sure we're spending our money in the right places. Um, we've also been very conservative in our revenue source. 
um, we're showing in this current mayor's proposal that there's a, a significant dip in the REIT, uh, the retail excise uh, tax. That there's also a significant reduction in the uh, traffic camera and that we're very modest in our sales tax. Um, we do have sort of this structural issue where we are showing about a half million dollars worth of additional costs, whether it's radar, salaries, other issues that is not being addressed. But we have a very large reserve. And one of the things about uh, financial numbers is one of my directors for many years always said, uh, whatever I show and whatever cliff I show, it, it will change. I can't tell you what the future beholds, but we will figure out a way to make it work. And so this cliff that we thought we were gonna fall off a few years ago hasn't occurred, it's been pushed out, um, but we have such a large reserve compared to what our uh, minimum reserves are that people would look at, look at us and say, how can you raise our taxes when you have such a large reserve now and you aren't spending the money the way that we think would be the most productive. So I think when we look at the message, it's, um, I'm not sure that it's the right message to send. Can I ask Councilmember Lebo a question? Councilmember Lebo, what do you, what do you think our reserve is? that, which shows in the end of 2022, um, 6.5 million as a general fund balance. And, Is, do you, and so are you calling the general fund, the ending balance of the general fund, you're calling that the reserve? See, I don't call that the reserve. The reserve is at the end of 2022, correct me here, is just over 1.5 million. And that's the 16%. That's the 16% on the, that's the, on the revenue. That's the true reserve. Yes, it's not, because you, 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 Pardon me, I may have misspoke. Uh, our reserve is as is roughly 1.5 million. Yes. Our general fund balance is three times our reserve. Right. At and 6.5 million. And what do you know about the general fund balance and the plans we have for it? That we have a general fund balance. So the general fund balance is not unrestricted money. The general fund balance includes projects that we already have identified and that we will um, in fact carry out in the next year or two. So it is not money that can be used for anything. It's already been spoken for. It is not available just for whatever we want. Am I correct in that? So there are some restrictions within the general fund money, but then some of the other funds have more restrictions. The rate paying funds have more restrictions around them, but there are some general fund revenues that do have restrictions around them. In addition to restrictions, are there also plans that we have for projects and salary increases and other things that in fact, that money that is currently the ending fund balance of the general fund will be used for, and we already know that. So salaries and benefits is the bulk of the general fund and what we spend that on. And there has been, as has come forward in the department presentations, um, a lot of inflation challenges that uh, going forward, are going to be continued discussions, but the more of the projects and the capital side 
does go into more of the other funds, the capital improve, the strategic opportunity fund, the um, the uh, capital improvement fund, transportation fund, and then the capital rate paying funds. And did I'm going to pass it over to city administrator. I just wanted to point out that, yes, we do begin the next biennium at 6.5 million, but we are dipping into that. And you'll see the ending fund balance at 5.5 million. Now there could be some one-time funds that we're not anticipating. Um, to the point of REIT, both the state and the county are looking at a 35% reduction in REIT in this upcoming biennium. I don't think we've predicted quite that dire of a percentage decrease, but we have decreased it because of, of the changing market that we're seeing today. Um, to the point of the traffic cameras, that was a one-time huge bump that came as a result of the cohort model during the school year. And if you take, take that year out of, that, that's kind of an out, out of context year. If you take that out and you look at the history, we're, we're pretty close to historical amounts um, for the upcoming biennium for the traffic cameras. So we are spending the dollars to operate the city. That, that's where the dollars are going out of the general fund reserve this year, which speaks to that structural deficit that we have. Council member Riddle, please. <clears throat> Thank you. So I wanted to just speak just briefly about like what my goals and I'm seeing for this budget cycle. And it's very similar to what we've already been talking about. So it shouldn't be a surprise. But I think it might help put some context in where I'm coming from. Um, one, as we've all spoken of, it's addressing the transparency of the challenges of where our money is coming from and why we have structural deficit. I think we keep coming back to that over and over again. Um, so I think clarifying that internally as well as with our community is going to be critical for us moving through this, this budget cycle. Safety is something that we've been talking about, and we, we have made little chisels onto that uh, problem, but I think we're not going to make any significant movement on that with a, a budget that doesn't bring in some additional specific revenue for uh, mobility, safety, pedestrian safety. Uh, staffing challenges. I believe in a living wage. I believe that we need to really look hard at what our city is offering folks to come work here. We're a very special community. We're in a great place to work, but it's really hard to attract applicants. And I think we need to look at what that looks like. So there's another dollar you know, amount attached to that in some way. And then we haven't really spoken yet of the climate change impacts that we're going to be getting a report and how do we then make sure that we're prepared and poised to be able to address those issues? Because that is a very time sensitive issue. And as soon as we get recommendations, we need to be willing to be able to start moving forward on them. And if we don't have some of these revenue flows in place or being able to offset those one-time funds that we've been using as an ongoing revenue source and rethink of them as towards these climate change, one-time impact resolution uh, or sort of applications, I think we're going to be really struggling. Um, so I don't want to overtax literally and figuratively our community, but we have some big issues coming up that we, I think, need to move money towards. And so I appreciate the conversation of we have a lot of money that looks like it's available, but I think it's in a way earmarked for a lot of ongoing operations and things of that nature. So I, I don't see having this revenue discussion as being irrelevant. I think we are going to be looking very seriously at some of these revenue increases in order to deal with the climate change impact recommendations that'll be coming from the committee, staffing challenges, things of that nature. Thank you, Council Member Riddle. Other thoughts, did you? You look like you're raising your hand. No. Just wanted to go go around the room. We're getting a little bit of feedback. Oh, I'm sorry. American CEO. Yeah. So this is fun. You guys are all discussing the mayor's budget, which was put together in a a minefield because it sucks. Um, this isn't a joke. We are not making the money the city needs to survive. I know it's great just to go along, but in the real world, if you're not moving forward, 
And if you're just standing still or not moving forward, you're moving backwards. And that's what we're doing. Our budget cannot sustain what's going on. I mean, it's just, that's reality. And I'm gonna say this is kind of hard, but you guys got elected by people to make tough decisions. And that's what these are. And I gotta be honest, you know, you guys, I look up there, I, I was talking to, um, I can't believe her name downstairs. Jessica, sorry, but she just, Jessica downstairs, took her trip to Mexico to work at a, in New Mexico to help people. She took her week off for vacation. And we were talking about, because I've done that quite a few times, and how when you come back, the first thing you do is you go to San Diego to get on the plane, and the first thing everybody does is run in and use the toilet, because having a flushing toilet is the most amazing thing on earth. And we're worried about $6, I understand that. But, you know, we have people, young couples paying 1.5 million that I've talked to at every event. I've met new people that bought houses for that amount of money in this city. You know, there's nothing stopping the council from going and helping all the people that don't have the money. You know, you guys can do that. And what I would suggest is educate because I've talked to the King County Assessor. Very few people take care of the take care, take part in the options they have to save themselves money educating people the way to save their money, we can do that. But we can no longer, we have to make decisions. I put this stuff in my budget. My budget message isn't like, hey, hey, everything's great. It's, it's gonna be tight, but we gotta start somewhere. Phil's been preaching that. I understand and I do love the reserves. I am not, I don't wanna be around here when we have the earthquake and we don't have any money sitting there to help people. I know it's a great world, but I've seen too many places that didn't think they were going to have problems, and they did, and that's why we have reserves. And Tom knows darn well what it was like when we started. There was no reserves, and we feel much better about that. We do a fantastic job. You guys do a fantastic job. We have a staff that is working really hard, but we have got to make ourselves, we are here to make our city better, not just survive. And I'm not very proud of our parks because I wish they would be prettier and I wish we could take care of them more. And I want the lakefront property, but until we figure out a way to get some income um, and Tom and Philip, I know I really am getting tired of having to go beg for every penny we get in this city. It's hard. I've been doing it for 12 years and it's hard to go and keep doing that. We have to start taking care of ourselves and our job as a council and mayor is to take care of the citizens and make the decisions that we need to make. So. I put all those stuff on the table. You guys saw them. I wasn't able to give anybody anything extra in any of my departments. But as everybody knows, we are going to have to take care of our city to keep our police department and we've got to keep our employees. So I'm just saying that because I we've gone in the weeds a lot along this thing where we really your big decision here is just are we going to move forward and do this? We can't change the, the property tax. But the other stuff, we can definitely explain how it's done and why we're doing it. And I think most people here are totally approved with having plumbing that works. And they also want to do better for the environment with the surface water. So I don't think we're doing anything wrong. I think we're just, it's hard to make these decisions. But please, I'm asking you guys just to keep focused on the prizes that we got to keep the city moving forward. And it's our job. And that's why we're elected. So thank you guys for everything you do. But I know it's tough, but we need to make the decisions. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, colleagues, we're getting uh, close to the bottom of the hour and we're scheduled till 7.30. Director Vaughn, you've been uh, very patient there. Did you have additional slides? And I'll circle back to something you're about. No, actually all of my slides are complete and um, I uh, request that the clerk actually turn this off so that you guys can move <laughs> on to the next part of your discussion. And I'll stay here to be a part of it. <laughs> Thank you. I think that um, th this is a this is a challenging topic, and 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 Mr. Lebo, I hear I I do hear you. From just a couple of thoughts, one is that um, if we are choosing not to go down the path of some of these levers, as as we've talked about, uh, we are uh, we are basically choosing to go and dip into dip into reserves at some point very 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 shortly um depending on what the package turns out to be as as we as we recommend uh to the administration so that's the question it, it, it really colleagues it comes down to what's your comfort level of getting into looking at 
dipping into uh, reserves. Um, I would remind everyone that we do have a budget stabilization fund, but it is pretty it is pretty meager from from the standpoint of of where we where we are, and, and certainly is not going to solve this um, challenge that we have coming down the pike. On a more personal note, the mayor is absolutely correct. And, and that's probably where I'm coming from is that history of starting in a hole and a pretty darn deep one actually, uh, where we had to claw our way out to get to a place where we're not waiting for the next hole to open up in front of us. So if it informs your understanding of my perspective, that's history is what I am and, and coming back to. And, and I do think it's really instructive to note that in our last budget discussion about reserves, that was a topic of people saying, don't touch those. Uh, and, and now we're getting a little bit of a converse out there in the community from a couple of people that, well, maybe you should. So I understand people can change their minds, but at the same time, I'm also, uh, I, I do want to um, let history be our guide about the comments that were made previously and keep those in mind as well as what's being, people have said now. And I think we'll hear more at the public hearing, certainly. Um, so with that, I wanted to take, uh, let's take a, take a second. Are there any more thoughts about this question of revenues and these uh, various options that the administration has pre presented to us? We can certainly we can certainly come back to it, Councilman uh, Vice Chair Castro. Yes, thank you. I just would like to have everybody be very careful about how you use language. End fund balances and reserves are two different things, and an end fund balance is what you need to keep going in the next months before you get the next revenue stream in. Um, the reserves are there for emergencies. And, and the, so they're just two different things. And I, I just think we have to be very, very careful about how we use that language uh, so that the general public does not get misled here. Um, so um, I took careful notes when we first got the chart that, that we looked at a little while ago. And it's, it, we have to just really keep remembering that there were one-time revenues that were responsible for these end fund balances remaining as high as they are looking right now, but we cannot count on those occurring in the future. So our future picture does not look like the past. It may look different. Maybe the pandemic will come back and we'll get more ARPA funds. I very much doubt it, however, if you are paying attention to the kind of conversations that are going on in Washington DC right now. So we have to be very, very careful about making predictions that look like things will turn up in the future because I'm not so sure they will for a while yet, given the inflationary pressures that we're seeing. And if you look at the worldwide inflationary pressures, they are far more intense pretty much everywhere but here. In Europe, they're 10% plus. Even good economies like Holland, for example, is running at 14% right now. So, you know, just, just be cautious, everybody. It is not going to be pretty in the next few years, and we need to be ready for that. The other issue that we really are facing, I think, is a crisis in hiring. Um, we are down a few positions, a few key positions in the city. We are not going to be able to hire in those positions given our current, current salary levels. That, that just isn't going to happen. So we have to be very cautious and very careful if we want the level of services that the city, the citizens currently enjoy to remain what they have been. So I am... Um, I do not want to spend down our reserves, which is that 1.5 million, because there could be crises in the future that we don't imagine, we can't imagine right now. And we need to be grateful that we have the ending fund balances that we have right now, because they will carry us through a few more years until those lines cross, because our 1% ability to raise property taxes 
is not anywhere even close to the kind of cost increases that we see on an annual basis. So, so that's where I'm at. And I just, I just need for you guys to know that I'm, I'm in a different generation than some of you. I've seen up the ups and downs of the economy. I don't think it'll always be down, but I think you have to be ready for some years of difficult times right now. And um, I've been through it before. So that's, really, that's all I really have to say. Thank you, Philippa. Uh, Councilman Riddle. Thank you. Um, kind of along the same vein, I really think we should start listening to our community about what they want that we can't do right now, whether that's salaries and benefits, whether that's um, improving our parks um, or dealing with our road safety issues. And I think that we should start having those conversations about what would the community be willing to do for another levy lid lift? What would that look like? What would be the time frame for it? What would, what would be the appetite for that? And I think having those conversations now over a longer period of time to really understand and educate. We all know that the property tax issue is a huge education issue because we really don't understand it too well, but we know what it means. We, it, you know, we know what it means when we when when we say that your value goes up twenty percent, but you're not going to be paying twenty percent more in taxes, not at least to Lake Forest Park. So I think because of the education issue around that, I think we should start having those conversations now, and then asking the community, what is, what do you want to use this on? We have Safe Street Study. We have. The, you know, uh, a parks recommendations already kind of in place. We have tools that we can let, lean on to have those conversations with our community. And then of course, improving our parks. We still don't have a plan for the lakeside property. So how do we make those things happen that our community was so excited when we got five acre woods. They were so excited when we got Brookside Park and when we got the lakefront property, but we haven't been able to move it forward uh, into that because of the issues we've been having uh, around the economy. Uh, and second, I, I am 100% behind uh, Vice Chair Cassover. The one-time funds have really floated us. ARPA, as she mentioned, has been big at keeping us going. As well, before that was the, the Southern Gateway project. And, and it changed her hands a few times, a couple times. That revenue was unexpected and it really helped to keep us moving forward. We don't have many properties that can do things like that, that can be developable, especially multiple times in a row, other than town center. And we know that that hasn't been developed since it was essentially developed the very first time. So the likelihood of that happening at least is slim, right? We love it. We want that here for our community, but let's be honest. So I, I think that we've looked at these amazing one-time fund opportunities that have, as others have mentioned, floated us. I don't see many more of those on the horizon of the a significant quality and quantity that would continue us forward. Uh, so I think we really need to start having those uh, conversations with our community. What, was a, what would a levy lift look like that they would be willing to do? And what would they want to do with it? So anyways, th that's where I see us going here in the next budget cycle and then next year or budget deliberations in the next year. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member, Council Member Odie. Thank you very much. Um, I think that uh, I agree with uh, both Council Member Riddle and Council Member Cassover. Um, I do think we have rough times ahead. Um, uh, likely, it sounds like we, if not going into recession, we're gonna skirt recession. Um, the inflationary pressures are not going to turn around that quickly. And this is an, a package of um, very modest proposals, um, most of which are targeted towards specific um, actions and, and, uh, and program budgets. So, and then I think that Council Member Riddle has articulated some of the uh, the issues that we need to make sure we're covered in the general fund for. Um, in addition to hiring to fill the gaps, I wanna retain 
our excellent staff. And that is a really, really important consideration for me because they've been holding down the fort through both the pandemic and now the fact that we have staff shortages. So I just really want to make sure that we have the ability to properly um, pay and retain our staff. Um, the Climate Action Plan, I, obviously we're not going to do incredibly expensive, costly things, but there will be some targeted things, whether it's electric vehicle, um, fleet vehicles, or you know something like that, which we, so far there hasn't actually been, uh, there's been a lot of talk at the state and county level about climate action, but there hasn't really been any money coming our way for that. Um, you know, there may be some partnership opportunities for affordable housing. We've 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 heard some of those presentations. Um, I want to emphasize what the mayor said. Our goal is to, when we leave council, leave our city better than when we got here as council members. To me, this is a modest set of financial proposals, quite targeted. Um, although there's some flexibility in there in the general fund. And, and so I, I think uh, like council member Cassover, uh, I'm kind of feeling somewhat impassioned about the fact that this is um, the right path forward for us. Thank you, council member. Colleagues, other thoughts? Mr. Furutani. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Yeah, and uh, I want to add my voice to Council Members Bodie and Casover and, and Riddle about uh, this This budget is something that puts us in the right place. I agree, with, especially with Council Member Riddle's uh, comment about having to educate our community about these increases and why they're necessary and to set the stage for how do we do things on top of this, like, for instance, the Lakefront Park, like, for instance, additional accessibility and walkways. So, um, you know, to the the point that you made about the climate action plan yes there you're we're not looking for anything big but you know the uh um I, I think the very important thing about the reserve fund as the mayor pointed out is that what if we do have a fire come up our ravines what if we have increased flow in McAleer and lion creek what do we do then and having that reserve is not a terrible thing because of course uh you know maybe the federal government will come through at some point but we have to be able to cover immediate costs when those kinds of things happen so i think this is a very prudent budget that puts us in a place where we can deal with that sort of thing while still having an eye towards the future. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Fertani. Councilmember Golden. Um, I'll keep things brief because I'm basically going to be agreeing with what the people before me have said. Um, I think this is prudent. Um, I am concerned about the general fund being drawn down too much over time. And if we can do something to slow how quickly the general fund is being drawn down, I think that is prudent and we should look into that. Um, so I'm generally supportive of, of things and I do think community engagement, um, I was very disappointed when Prop 1 failed. And so what can we do with the community to make them realize that we barely have enough money to maintain the status quo, let alone do new things. And so what can we, you know, how can we bring the community on board with this? But in terms of the budget, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm supportive. Thank you, Council Member. I think that uh, just quickly from another thought on my per from my perspective, you've heard my thoughts about drawing down the, the, on the general fund or even the reserves for that matter. You think about really basically what, what you both have said, well, it's been said several different ways, but if there was a, a, a surface water incident where we have a capital failure someplace, that um, we've seen these things happen before. If there's something happens and there's a, um, a challenge. What if there's a major event? There could be one or two kinds of multi-million dollar sort of situations where, yes, we would probably, I'm envisioning what we'd have to do to, to, to pay for them. We'd have to do probably an interfund loan to take care of some things uh, uh, until we could try to find some additional financing if we had to, it was a major kind of situation. But again, I'm, I, I do believe, to Councilmember Bodie's point, I think the proposals are a modest set of proposals. And because of the failure of Proposition 1, uh, and we've learned a lot of lessons there, and, and this conversation with the community needs to be very robust and continue, um, we're 
we're a ways out from being able to do that again. Uh, and, and that means that in the interim, we're going to be, it gets it, makes it that much harder for us to, to start that curve back to even leveling off, uh, let alone going down again. Uh, and so, uh, or climbing again, excuse me. So that's, those are my thoughts. I do want to do a time check here. We're, we're 10 minutes over. Um, we were scheduled to go till 7.30. We still have on our, um, not specifically on our agenda, but as I indicated on our, um, in, our in my email to you all, uh, discussions about spe specific changes you'd like to see to, to the budget, um, as well as any provisos that we would be considering. Now, just for clarification, we do have, we have a public hearing coming up that may help us get some additional understanding about the topics at hand that we've been discussing. Uh, and then we have a special meeting on the third that's optional, but I'm going to say that it's not going to be optional at this point because I think this discussion needs to continue. Um, so it really it comes down to what's your pleasure, colleagues. Do you want to have go through your lists uh, quickly of these particular um, um, specific changes or do you want to defer that until after the public hearing, which is coming, coming down the line? What's Mr. Lieber? What if we circulate the uh, list to the council members so that they have time to look at it and that might facilitate a, a review? The other is that um, I'm not opposed to raising taxes as a way to invest within our community and also to um, take the advantage of educating our community to some of the challenges that we face. And I think when we look at cities like Kenmore and Bothell or others that either have set up uh, financial stabilization um, committees or um, ad hoc committees to look at the finances for a city. I think that goes a long way to help educate the city about what we have going on here. So it's not just um, seven council members deciding how we're going to spend the monies and describe what we're gonna do. Um, I believe Shoreline has a six year levy, which is intended to be a financial stabilization fund for the city. And I think one of the great benefits of that kind of system is while it's expensive to operate, it does provide a educational opportunity for the citizens to, and that they get an opportunity to then vote on what they want. So I think the challenge, and this is what I'm trying to express is that we need to have plans and that there's a difference between spending down reserves, which I am not uh, suggesting, but we do have a fund balance. Uh, we do have quite a large fund balance, which is separate from our reserves. So. Thoughts, I, at the risk of getting myself into a whole lot of work, uh, I'll, I'll hold that thought for a sec second. Councilman Rue. Yeah, I appreciate, I think, us uh, maybe circulating our ideas, or, and, uh, but I think to truly get into an understanding of what we're each thinking, I'd, I'd prefer us to lay that to the next meeting. Okay, so just so we, uh, you, you kind of beat me to the punch there. We can't circulate the ideas, but we can do what we did the last go around. You may individually send them into me, make sure that you do not send them to any other discussion with any other, more than two other council members. Uh, one other council member in addition to me, please, so we don't have any uh, implied or uh, assumed violations of the OP OPMA. Um, and then I'll aggregate those, and then we will bring them back for discussion. Uh, we'll put them up on the board, and we can have have a real robust discussion about them. Councilman Riddle, you look like you had a. I was going to. I, I thought per, uh, we can we can push one out to the, but no one can respond. I, I apologize if that isn't what I implied. I'm trying to think of how we'd be able to, I wish Kim was here to make sure that we can, we stay on the straight and narrow. Um, Mr. Hill, do you have any thoughts about this? I'm trying to think about the best way to do this so there's no. Let's have them all come in to you. And then yeah. we will check with Kim tomorrow okay. and just make sure. I, I think you're not going, as long as you're not discussing them, if they're just presented as the ideas of the council members, I, I think we're fine. But we'll double check with Kim. We don't have okay. anybody in hot water. Well, I'll tell you what, one of- We should be cautious. 
Yeah, I, I, I agree. So look, I'll tell you what, why don't we do this? We will, um, I'll have a conversation with the administ administration, the administration about this tomorrow after they've had a chance to connect with Kim. I'll send an email delineating what's, what is acceptable, and what's not acceptable, and then we'll go from there. And then the, uh, we'll make sure that they are, regardless, we'll make sure that they're aggregated at, at some point before that meeting so that we can take, um, I'll have a chance to take a look at them as a, as a body and have a discussion about them. Does that seem reasonable to everybody? Okay, good. Um, with that, I'm going to move on to public comment. Matt, is there anyone out there in the stratosphere or whatever we're calling it today? Actually, it's clean air, so we'll... If you want to address the council, please use the raise hand function. I think we have one attendee. I can barely see that from here. Can you can you show us the list of attendees, please? Uh, I I can't. I have a technical difficulties at the okay, moment. Okay, no problem. Um, well, if you'd like to make public comment, please use the raise hand function. Um, to our one attendee. Doesn't look like it. Okay. <laughs> thank you, Matt, and uh, thank you all for for a great conversation today. And we will. As a reminder, we ha do have a meeting uh, coming up on, on Thursday. <laughs> and then check your budget calendar for the other days. So we're adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Matt, I got kicked off. Is everything okay?